Welcome to Pet Sitter Confessional, an open and honest discussion about life as a pet sitter. Brought to you by Time to Pet and Pet Perennials. Why is animal behavior so hard to understand? Or is it? And how do we make sure we are most prepared for the emergencies when we need to use pet first aid and CPR? Today, we are super excited to have Arden Moore, podcaster, radio host, author, and educator extraordinaire back on the show to dive into all things behavior and pet first aid and CPR. From whether you should use Neosporin or how to pill a cat properly, Arden shares her best tips for taking care of those situations and why we should be paying attention more to the environment of the animals that we're caring for. Let's get started. Well... I wear a lot of collars in the pet world, and my last name says it all, more. But I am so happy to be on your show, um, Colin. Pets are the best. Uh, for 20 years, believe it or not, I was an investigative newspaper reporter when they were covering real news. And then I went to the publishing world and wrote for Prevention Magazine and Men's Health. And I'm really dating myself. Now add another 20. And... I love being in the pet world. I've been in the pet world since around 2000 and in many aspects from writing for Catster and Dogster magazine to hosting not one, but two shows. I have the longest running pet podcast on the planet. Just trying to pop those peas. <laughs> it's called Oh Behave and it's on uh, Pet Life Radio. Been on the air since 2007 with half a million listeners. Mm. And then in 2022, I got invited by Talk Radio to start a nationally syndicated pet radio weekly show called Arden Moore's Four-Legged Life Show, and it streams, and it's also on YouTube. Just go to Arden Moore YouTube channel. And then I've written over 27 pet books, and as you've mentioned, uh, my big passion is saving pet lives and helping people do it. I'm a master instructor in pet first aid and CPR with uh, pet uh Pet First Aid for You, and I'm also the Director of Education for a two-day instructor training program with Pro Pet Hero. Is the show over now? I just did my whole bio. <laughs> yep, and thanks for listening to us today. No, oh, that was it. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the proud pet parent to a furry Brady Bunch that includes a pair of dogs, Kona and Emma, and four cats, Casey, Rusty, Mikey, and Baxter. And today we're going to be talking with you about animal behavior um, because you've recently have some new books that have come out around that topic. And it is one that many of us think we know behavior <laughs> or maybe we have no experience. You know, I, I've, I've recognized that as Megan and I have hired people into our company, there's a lot of ground that we have to cover with people who are pet parents, but interested in doing more. And so, yeah. and, and, and the fact that most of us started a pet care business without any experience or knowledge, we just love pets or we have a knack for it. Now, all of a sudden, we've got to start learning the other things that go around this so that we're conducting safe, good visits for the pets. And so as far as the animal behavior goes, Arden, <laughs> I, I just just that topic, I guess. But like, I, I think many people are con are confused by it uh, because well, they, they don't they don't quite get it. And wh where, where do you think that comes from? Well, put yourself in the paws of your dog or your cat, or as a pet sitter, you know, you're going into a client's home. This is a this is a sentient being that has to be multilingual. They they need to speak dog. If there's another, if there's a cat, they need to understand cat. They need to do body language. They need to speak English. Maybe you're speaking Spanish too. I mean, you think about it. There is a lot required of a four or three legger, and and it's communication and it's two way communication. So I love those T-shirts where they say sit, 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 and then in the mind in the bubble of the dog's brain is I'm going to wait till they say sit 17 times before I do it. <laughs> So I think part of it is we don't realize that when it comes to communicating, the clearest and best communicator is, are the dogs and the cats and not really us, because we cause canine confusion. We cause feline frustration because we don't realize it's a two-way conversation. We don't. And then we get caught up. And many times we're bringing in a rushed schedule, a busy day, other frustrations. Uh, we are trying to frantically go through things and we, we rush. And I, I feel like a lot of times that this lost in communication just happens from, from our standpoint. And I love how you started that conversation or that explanation with the, the pet's point of view. 
And yeah. really, we need to take that step back and and recognize um, where they're where they're coming from <laughs> and. and what- <laughs> And what well, we're yeah, doing. that's. That, I mean, you guys as pet sitters are walking in, and you don't know if you're going to get a, a sweet dog, or a cujo in a crate, or a, a cat that purrs, you know, like a Mack truck, or a cat that wants to shred you, and they smell our emotional state. Their senses are so much better than us that it is really important what you say, how you say it. And how you approach and and for your safety and for upping the communication of the cat and dog. So when I meet a dog or a cat for the first time, I never bend down and put my face in their face and talk baby talk. Because especially dogs who are all about rank, I just became a buck private in their mind. <laughs> um, and for the cat, they're like, really? You don't know anything about cats? I approach first. Mm-hmm. So I'm always pretty quiet and let them have time to download and taking a deep breath in for four seconds and letting it out for four seconds. I know it sounds like namaste and all that, but this is something I learned from first responders. Mm. It actually puts you in a calmer state, which makes you actually more welcoming to that dog or cat meeting you for the first time. And more present to be reading that body language, to be paying attention. And I know that can be kind of, off-putting to some people of especially when you're meeting them for the first time with the pet parents there yeah, we want to yeah. we want to we want to appear warm and welcoming and ooey gooey down in their face petting them but it's a great educational opportunity Thank i you. think to the pet parents it is and it's and it is to do it in a non-preachy way but in a more hey we're in this together you're handing over the reins of your most priceless asset to me your dog or your coolest asset your cat while you're working or going on vacation and i want you to know i'm competent i'm calm and i'm going to be there for that pet and i personally would rather have a person with your calmness being a meet and greet than someone gushing over my dog or cat and forgetting to talk to the person, forgetting to look around and forgetting to read the signals that that dog or cat is giving. So I think this is really a really important uh, tip we can give all our, our professional pet sitters out there. So when it comes to maybe some specific dog behaviors that can be kind of confusing <laughs> to, to people where, where do you where, where would you start oh let's go to the crotch crotch for 200 please okay. Colin. <laughs> um seriously you know a dog sticks their nose in your crotch and you're like offended and the dog is not meant to offend the dog is downloading you that nose is telling that dog have you been spayed or neutered don't worry colin i'm not asking you um <laughs> what did you have for breakfast how healthy are you right now? Uh, what's your emotional state? And and think about those superpowers that the nose of a dog or a cat has. Can you imagine if we had those superpowers in uh, electing officials? I don't care if you're red, green, plaid, blue, whatever. No one could bluff. Yeah. And we would get the straight skinny. But a dog is doing what a dog has been downloaded to do, which is to sniff the rear to see friend or foe. And so we need to re-channel that. So, you know, in my book, the Dog Behavior Answer book, we actually give some tips on how to make a proper introduction that works for both the dog and the person. And and so um, I'm just, you know, that's just one tip. I don't know if that helps you out. No. Well, it does. I, I know, again, because again, we're doing this introduction in the context of being in people's homes. Right? Yeah. And so I, I've had this happen and the owner just freaks out. They're super apologetic. They're pulling the dog away. Now, all of a sudden, it's a bit frantic. And again, we need to be in this mindset of 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 educating opportunities and talking so, to owners. Yeah, redirect. Uh, say before the meet and greet, hey, uh, a pet parent, have like a, a few little pieces of one bite and swallow treats that your dog really likes. And so when I walk in the door and he goes for my crotch, why don't you redirect um, Kona? And toss a treat away from you, Colin, yeah. and and say, go get it. And then do another treat where he has to sit and get the treat. And then maybe teach him to shake a paw. So the dog is still getting to greet you, but now there's a payoff. Mm. And it's it's a treat. And there's less, um, you know, craziness, chaos. 
<laughs> it is and that, that chaos because I know trying to manage these first meetings, even second and subsequent meetings. Yeah, can your first impressions lot. mean yeah. a lot. And I think it's always good in a meet and greet. Uh, I'm the editor of the NAPS uh, Pet City magazine, so I get the opportunity to talk with people like you, professionally trained pet sitters all the time and, and be able to share what they're saying. You know, I think there's a pre-meet and greet where you might have a quick call. I know Scott Black is a former uh, Pet Sitter of the Year for Pet Sitter International. And he said, I have a nice conversation. I'm old school and I have a conversation with that person. So when I walk in the door, we know what to expect. Yeah. And I think just taking that little time might be good for both the pet sitter and the pet parent and especially the pet. Yeah. Because again, you're managing a lot going on. You are trying to take in new information. You're trying to write yeah. down. You're trying to see if this is going to be a good fit while also handling a proper introduction to the dog and trying to understand <laughs> what the client's doing. There's a, there, it, there's a, lot. a lot of chaos. And, and if you, without a plan, it just kind of, you can walk out of these. I've, I've certainly done that on days and gone, really? holy moly, what, did I, <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. And everybody's home is different. You know, uh, there's there's people that are real neat freaks and there's people that, you know, are, like to collect things. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I watch the pet. I'm watching the pet's vibes. And that tells me a lot. So I think you, we use, uh, you know, I jokingly have this uh, cup that says uh, wag more, bark less. <laughs> well, I think what it means is we need to use our ears as much as we use our mouth. Mm. And pay attention with your eyes. Look, listen, you know, and, and get some vibes because uh, that makes it a success for everything. I think what you all do, I mean, you're in the trenches. Being a professional pet sitter is a tough job. And I have total respect. And you're walking in a stranger's home and you don't know how the pet is going to greet you when they're not there. Mm. Yeah. And especially it it could be, again, we keep coming back to this the first time, second time, third time. They're all going to be different. You don't yes. know what happened in that home while you were away. The trash truck drove by, the bo dogs were barking or uh, neighbors were out doing something, you know, uh, you know, cleaning the driveway or whatever. And that's now triggered yeah. the dog. So kind of that, that, what's that saying? You never step in the same river twice. Sometimes you, you never, <laughs> yeah. you never meet the same dog twice. Or the twice. same dog poop twice. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you, men you mentioned ears. Uh, what are some things that we should be listening for? Thank you. Would thank you. Because maybe there's a ceiling fan that's making a screeching noise or um, maybe there is an like we feed uh, community cats outside our home on a porch and maybe uh, the dog heard the, the, the cat at the food bowl and wants to know what's going on. Or maybe there's one of the many you, uh, um, Amazon or Chewy.com delivery people coming up the steps. All of these are alerts to the ears of the dog, and it causes a distraction. And so I'm trying to have dog ears. I'm trying to, in a meet and greet, not only listen to the words of the client, but pay attention to the verbal cues that the dog or cat is 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 paying attention to. So it's a big task, but it has a payoff, you know? Yeah, and we're listening to the environmental sounds because a lot of pet owners will leave a fan on so yeah. that, that for, for quote unquote white noise for their pets. Well, if yeah. there's a screeching or a clicking or clanking, you, I wouldn't want to be in a home for 24 hours a day listening no, to that. No, no we do uh, HGTV because it's a conversational thing when we go out to dinner or something yeah. um, because I don't want some loud screaming, you know, Walking Dead thing or rock star. So I try to mimic what is normally heard in our household with this conversation conversation. And I think you made a good point. So the dog's ears and the cat's ears, they hear so much better than us and they, they can't turn it off. So right. can you imagine you being in a situation with no thumbs and you can't turn off the ceiling fan that's squeaking? That would drive me crazy. <laughs> you, you walked us through the the confounding uh, behavior for dogs. Um, cats can be a whole other enigma for me. People, <laughs> because I, I think it's mostly because a lot of us don't have a lot of experience with them. Um, cat care is only now really becoming yeah, increasingly finally. popular, finally. And yeah. so there's a re great opportunity there. But we may be staring at a cat going, what? <laughs> what do you... Hell, huh? <laughs> well, I, I think it's... And it, this is a good time to be a cat. Mm. And I say that because there are more and more uh, attention studies 
and behaviors being uh, um, focused on the feline. The feline compared to the dog, they haven't really changed the DNA much. There's a book years ago called The Lion in Your Living Room. And Colin, we do have a lion in our living room. We have not tweaked the genes of the DNA of, of a cat as much as we've done to domesticate the dog. So they are hunters and they are always wary of being hunted. Mm. And the other thing is they're not pleasers. They're negotiators. They're also um, really good at observing and our behavior. You swear they have invisible watches on because when it is 4.58 and you're supposed to feed them at 5 o'clock, you almost see the wristwatch come out and they're, <laughs> now, now, and they're leading you into the kitchen. They're very smart, um, but they also have feelings. They also need enrichment. And there are groups out there. I mean, can you imagine, Colin, one of the fastest growing things happening in the world of cats is adventure cats. Yeah. Emily Hall with Kitty Cat Go is like turning the world on its axis because people are hiking, camping, and doing things with their cats now in backpacks and other things and leashes. And there are cats that surf. And I have a cat that's a therapy cat. Casey's also a first aid cat. They want jobs like dogs do. Mm -hmm. uh, social media, cats and sinks. Oh, my gosh. You just go to Instagram and see it. But there's cat cons. There's people out there like Trap King Sterling Davis and Nathan the Cat Lady. There's cat dating apps. Not dating a cat, but people who have cats are like, sure. yeah, we just want to make that clear. Um, but what I'm saying is there are cat-only pet first aid uh, pet sitting practices. Mm -hmm. And I just think we are just realizing people go to catvets.com and they're going to get a ton of veterinary backed information on cats and fear free, happy homes for both cats and dogs. So those are two good sites that I would highly recommend, but it is good to be a cat and the cat behavior answer book that I just wrote. Um, it's in a Q and a format. I mean, we do everything from, um, why does my cat insist on following me into the bathroom? We know that happens. And uh, um, to uh, why do some cats uh, purr and some rarely purr? And, you know, there's all these things, quirky things to us, but to the cat, it's perfectly normal feline behavior. So I don't know. I'm very glad to write both of these in the dog one, too, because I am both a student and a teacher. And I'm always learning from the very best in uh, veterinary behavior uh, and things like that with the Vanna White initials after their name. <laughs> but my role is to give out good science-backed information that helps the cat, the dog, and the human. Right. Well, and sometimes we've got to kind of I like to make, think of it as putting on our dog hat and our cat hat as we're going yeah. into interact could, because we, we need to remove some of our biases when we're from, OK, my dog versus my cat. And again, obviously, there's variation between these uh, in yeah. general, but going, OK, I'm, I may need to interpret some things a little bit differently walking into this house with a cat. I just came from seven dog visits. I'm doing a cat <laughs> visit now. I, I, I can't come in acting dog and I they know be... you've been to seven dogs <laughs> well, so that's that's the other thing too of of recognizing that what we're bringing into their environment and how that impacts them one of the best things because cats are all nose oriented is i also often recommend to the pet sitter ask the pet parent to have uh, like a bath towel with the cat's maybe a little of the cat's hair on it designated not the towel that's been used to to dry off the dog or anything just the cat mm -hmm. and have it ready because if a cat freaks out when you have to give medicine for example in a client's home um there's different ways to do a uh, towel wrapping we call it being a perrito but it has the cat's scent already on it so it is easy to grab and i would do it just practice you know when you're there, when they don't need medicine. So they're downloading predictability and it's like a security blanket and, and just don't bring in a towel from another client's cat's house. Cause that will happen. Yeah. So the scent is really important. Obviously there's feel away those artificial pheromones and DAP for dogs, adaptal, some work, some don't, but just realize with the cat, it's about the nose. And they smell safety, they feel safe. 
Have you heard of Time to Pet? Dan from NYC Pooch has this to say. Time to Pet has been a total game changer for us. It's helped us streamline many aspects of our operation, from scheduling and communication to billing and customer management. Uh, we actually tested other pet sitting softwares in the past, but these other solutions were clunky and riddled with problems. Everything in Time to Pet has been so well thought out. It's intuitive, feature rich, and it's always improving. If you are looking for new pet sitting software, give Time to Pet a try. Listeners of our show can save 50% off your first three months by visiting timetopet.com slash confessional. Many times we associate smell and scent with dogs because they're little, they're little, the marketing is done really yeah. good for that with yeah. dogs. But but really, the cats are picking up all this stuff. And so that's another kind of situational environmental thing that we need to take into account when we're coming to homes and going, huh, why is this cat all of a sudden extremely standoffish from me right now? It came to me yesterday. Okay, yeah. I need to see, did something change in their environment or something different about me? Did I see a new pet? Is what's going on? And, and kind of going through that checklist. Because if we have to give medications, if we have to do yeah. more involved interactions with the cat, all of that matters. Yeah, and I always tell people the best place to give any pet in a multi-pet household is in the bathroom. You have a confined space. It's cozy. You can hear a pill if it gets spit out on the floor. <laughs> and you don't have to worry about the other pets grabbing it or the cat getting strategically under the king-size bed, under the middle, just under, just beyond your finger reach. They go to school for that, I swear. <laughs> but if you get the bathroom set up with success, with yummy things, and, you know, they make those, uh, those um, pouches like churros or delicioso, I don't know the brands. But a lot of pet sitters now, if it's safe to do so, are crushing the little pill in a churro, and letting the kit, cat lick it off the off the counter, and they think they're getting a yummy, and it's an easy um, med administration. Yeah, and and so having everything ready in the bathroom with treats and a towel, and then uh, giving the medicine there in a calm manner, um, makes your job far less taxing and builds the the bond because now the cat's like looking at you like you're the churro champion, <laughs> and let's go get some treats from you know Uncle Colin. Yeah, which we, we want that relationship. And that does take some communication ahead of time with some clients. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why we encourage our clients and encourage everybody to work with their clients to get to that point where it's not a new thing or it's not right. an adverse kind of thing. Because what happens, uh, we have a client who the only time the cat ever sees the, uh, the towel come out is when it's getting its medication. There's nothing, there's no interaction. So this is the first cat that I've ever had that we were doing this visit and they didn't tell us about this ahead of time. They said, Oh, we, yeah, we, we do the kitty burrito. We do that. Blah, blah. I was like, okay, this cat was, would, would go to a four, almost a five on the fear scale. When we went and brought the towel out, as soon as I touched the towel, that cat was underneath Aww. yowling. I mean, just petrified of us because we touched the towel. And so those visits, looked very different. And now we were saying, okay, hey, like this wasn't fun for us or the cat. More more importantly, the cat. So here's, you know, you need to be doing this a little bit differently ahead of time. Here's try these different treats. We need to be making this a nice adventure for the yeah. cat. Not a terrifying thing for them. Yeah, you could take that towel, Colin, and put a little few pieces of kibble on the on the couch and be sitting away from it. Let the cat come up on his own. And get it and drop. And then you can put some little uh, catnip, run the towel around the floor, and just kind of improve the opportunity of that towel's offerings. But, yeah, I, I see how predictability and how good they are observing behavior. They have already connected the dots. Exactly. And uh, so, yeah, and, and part of it, I sh you guys have a tough job because you have to diplomatically talk to humans about why they're being dumber than batshit to their pets. <laughs> <laughs> well, Whoops, did I say that? <laughs> no, but you know what I'm saying. I know we all have good intentions yeah. and it is very, you have to be very diplomatic as a professional pet sitter, but you also are there to, to help the pet feel safe at home and also to have the peace of mind for the person leaving. And I salute you because that is quite, a challenge. And that does take pet, uh, that does take preparation. And yes. I think one, one of the things that we need to be prepared for are things like having a good 
not just conversations, being equipped with knowledge, but just the tools and things that we involve in our in our business. One of those is like a, a good first aid kit. And yeah. so I know there's a bunch of different options and things out there. You can buy 10,000 different varieties <laughs> on Amazon and whatever. Yeah. When, when you uh, sit down and you look at supplies, what are things that we need to have in, in a first aid kit? We'll go in. Well, I, I think, first of all, you should have a kit always in the car and you should always have a kit at home. And um, I, I've got a kit in my Pet First Aid for You classes I really like because it contains ingredients for people, dogs and cats, and it's waterproof. So to me, it's answering all that. But there are some things in a first aid kit that are big no-nos for dogs and cats. And one of them is the hand sanitizer. You know, during COVID, we we're all getting the COVID uh, germs off of us. But the skin on a dog and a cat is different than a, a person, and you're actually causing dizziness, respiratory issues, cracks in the skin, and damage to the mucous membranes. Just a warm washcloth would, uh, a warm, wet washcloth cleans a paw. Second, everybody in my classes take the hydrogen peroxide pledge, and we raise our right paw, and we promise never to give to clean a wound using hydrogen peroxide on a cat or a dog. We think that bubbling action is awesome. It's killing the bad boys. Oh, no, 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 no. We are actually destroying healthy tissue around the wound. So we're making it more open to infection. And think about it, Colin, this, of all the organs, if you're on Jeopardy and you get asked this question, Name the largest organ on a cat's body or dog. The answer is, what is the skin? Hmm. So if the skin is getting pelted, you're, you're also affecting their respiratory, their circulatory, their heart, their lungs, their livers. So good old plain old water to clean a wound and to, to learn how to take a first aid class and bandage a wound, monitor signs of shock, fading gums, and calling ahead, calling ahead on your phone to the veterinary clinic. These are great ways to increase the survivability of that dog or that cat. And so I, I just, I hope all the ER veterinarians that I'm so fortunate to be mentored by, they are like on a kick. Please, the, the only use of hydrogen peroxide on a dog or a cat and why it's in a kit is to induce vomiting when you definitely know they got in and swallowed a toxin like maybe your pain meds and the dog or cat is not vomiting and you're a distance from a vet clinic and there's a lot of things that can happen when you got a toxin in your body so you do need to have a vet on call like the poison control hotline or your or, or telehealth or a vet but we show in our classes the only safe way to give uh, hydrogen peroxide, and that's big tooth, little tooth, little tooth pocket <laughs> in the syringe. Uh, so we're very scientific in our classes, but that was a good one. But obviously rolled gauze and, you know, um, things that are safe for pets. We think we want to put burn cream on a dog or a cat. No, no, no. Mm. And fortunately, that also is wrong because we will pick probably the wrong cream made for people, not pets. And second, every EMT and paramedic I teach in my instructor training program will tell you we have to scrape all that you just did and start over. Uh. So you're making the skin more open for infection. So uh, cool water and a loose bandage monitor for shock is what the protocol is for us to get a pet with a burn to the vet. Mm. Now, I, I also see a lot of discussion around things like antibiotic ointments yeah. and having those on hand. Uh, is, that, is that something we should have or are there special varieties or um, does it matter? Yeah, you, you got to read. There's different label. There's different ingredients even in uh, neosporin, you know, yeah. and uh, there is a little controversy on that. Um, there are some that a pet can tolerate, but some pets just like us have some allergies. So... I'm more cautious, so I don't really reach for the Neo when uh, my pet has a, a cut or a wound. I, I use water and rinse and, uh, and uh, do a bandage. And I, so talk with your veterinarian, you know, look at the poison control hotline. You know, there is an association of uh, uh, critical care and emergency veterinarians. Um, get good information. Like to give you an example, I, I had... I'm going to ask you this: Is is our um, 
avocados toxic or not to dogs? <laughs> Colin? Uh, <laughs> Don't worry. It's okay. We're, we're friendly. Uh, yeah, I know a lot of people. Uh, it's uh, yes, I would say yes, it is. Okay. So I, I grew up as a newspaper reporter where if your mother told you she loved you, you say, my editor told me, check it out. So I'm getting, <laughs> so I'm getting information from one veterinarian say toxic. Another, no, just makes their stomach upset a little bit. So finally, finally, I reached the one expert that should know. And her name is Dr. Justine Lee. She is the only person in the United States of veterinarians who is board certified in critical care and emergency medicine. Wow, that hurts my brain. But she's also board certified in toxicology. Mm -hmm. And she has a great podcast called uh, ER Vet on Pet Life Radio. So I asked her and she goes, I'm so glad you asked me because I'm tired of my colleagues telling people misinformation. Here's the answer. Drum roll. Avocados are not toxic to dogs. However, some can have digestive upset. But the biggest danger is that slimy pit. So one tip that we included in the Dog Behavior Answer book is this. If you have a dog or a client's dog that loves to play fetch or is a counter surfer in the kitchen, you better make sure that that pit is in a garbage can out of paw's reach because it can do a perfect slimy seal against the airway. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to try to dislodge. So in our classes, we actually show a method Dr. Lee showed me on how to pop under the jawline to break that seal to grab the avocado pit. But the bigger tip is this. If you have a client who has a dog that loves to play ball and fetch, make sure always the ball is bigger than their mouth because then there's less risk of it sealing the airway. So for the big old labs that love it, you, you got to get a giant, a giant ball. And so that's a good safety tip that can prevent a trip to the ER. And I think part of that is recognizing what our role is in that situation for dealing with the injury and yeah. what context we're in. If maybe if, you know, if we are doing big, long adventure hikes where we're hiking to the mountain for six hours and we're removed oh. from everything, we, we need to be prepared for a little bit more intensive care out there versus if I have a minor scrape and a bruise and I'm three minutes from their vet right? and going, okay, how, what am I doing in this situation? What's my role? How accessible do I have to other information, other help if I need it? And, and knowing that that's, there's also the situational context that we're dealing in as well. Yeah. So um, I, I have a whole uh, a program in my Pet First Aid for You where we incorporate how to be a mutt giver. What do you do when you don't have a first aid kit? The vet is far away and you're out a distance. So, you know, there's things what we're wearing and things around us that we can use to render aid on the scene and to stabilize and transport an injured dog or cat from the drawstrings of your hoodie to making a water bowl out of a spare poop bag to uh, using a little aloe snapping from a tree to treat a, a minor uh, bleed. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that we have that we have at our disposal that we don't realize. I mean, the silly thing like an Ikea bag that you get, those blue bags, yeah. I keep one in my car. I encourage all pet sitters to do the same. Cut along the side, leave the sides with the handles on it, roll it up, and you have a makeshift gurney that does not cause any friction across a rug or a carpet should you have to get a big dog out of the living room and into your car. Mm. And it costs a dollar. <laughs> even, even, but it's things like that. And again, recognizing what, what we're required to do. I know one thing that happens quite a bit, unfortunately, are injuries to like the paws, the pads, oh, yeah. the, the toenails. Uh, what's, what's a tip that you could give us? We're out walking a dog. We break, the dog breaks the toenail, slices its pad on some broken glass that was clear and we didn't catch on the ground. What are we, wh wh where are we going with that? Yeah. And those things bleed. And, and in our class, I teach in bleeding about the gap. The G stands for gravity, A stands for artery, and P stands for pressure. So any dog that has ripped a nail out or, or, or caught a pad really badly and it's bleeding, they need to have that paw above the heart. Well, that means the dog isn't limping home if there's a lot of blood loss. Yeah. Because on a major bleed, like an arterial, an artery is infected, oh my gosh, Colin, they can die from bleeding out in five to seven minutes. So a big yeah. bleed, the paw has to be above the heart. 
you need to put a little pressure on the artery that's between the heart and the injury. And we teach that in our classes. And you have to put pressure on that wound. Now, I don't think you have a bar of soap handy, but if you did, or steptic powder, you can put that on the nail to kind of help slow it down, the bleeding. Um, if you have a spare sock, you know, we always wash our, our white socks and one lands in the dryer. Where did the other go? Sock heaven? I don't know. <laughs> but I keep my sock orphans in my car and I take them with me. So it could take that with a little shoelace or a spare poop bag. And you can put a little uh, wrap with the sock over the paw on the way, um, you know, to help uh, with the pressure. So there's things that you can do. Um, but uh, always remember, gravity can be a friend and gravity can be a curse. So any kind of bleeding always have the injury above the heart. Mm. Uh, so leg injuries, uh, paw injuries. Oh, my gosh. We had this lab come in uh, once. Uh, I, I get mentored by Dr. Mike Lasasso in uh, Frisco. He's an ER and critical care vet. And the guy brought in a lab in his arms who had yanked his nails out, and he was spurting blood all over the lobby, hitting people, walls, oh. pets. And the thing is, Dr. Mike said, if you have a really bad injury, call ahead, please, so we know you're coming. And he goes, I would have let him in the back door so he wouldn't have traumatized the entire uh, lobby. That dog's bleed took that professional team 40 minutes to finally completely stop bleeding, and they had to use silver nitrate. So some things are really bad, but your role in first aid is to stabilize, render aid, and get to the vet. So And always communicate to the vet. So don't ever underestimate a paw, a nail, or a leg bleed because they can really cause a lot of blood loss. Yeah, it's a, it is. It can be quite shocking, and that brings up another aspect of this: is that it all of the head knowledge of what to do in exact situations, and all of the extra socks and bags that we have in the trunk of our car <laughs> don't do a whole lot of good if we're not mentally ready or mentally oh, prepared for, yeah. for those for those situations. So. How how can we be more prepared for that? Because I know that's a big one. Of uh, we that's tend to go really through our days question. of going. Um, I, I I've experienced this with more people again as we've hired of. There tends to be assumption of everything is awesome and everything's great and sunshine, and then when something <laughs> bad, <laughs> and then yeah. the, something bad happens, and all of a sudden it's a it's a shock to our uh, to our system. It it is, and and I'm so glad we teach the mental game of first aid, which I think is the most important skill set you could have. So I jokingly, but importantly say, you all get permission to freak out later. <laughs> no, that's really important. If you know, and a lot of ER people and people in first responders, they know that when things have stabilized, they can run up a mountain, they can scream in the shower, they can have a shot of fireball, whatever is their go-to. But once things have been stabilized and handed over, you have to have a release. Mm -hmm. But you have to be in the now, in the present moment. And so this first thing, getting permission to freak out later, kind of is a game changer. The second thing is to control and be in the present moment by taking a breath in, holding it for four seconds, letting it out for four seconds. It actually chemically helps you get into the present moment and like the other thing, very important, be a first responder, which means you look forward, left, right, up, down, behind you. You listen, you smell, you safely touch before you approach because you're gathering clues to help you be the best you can when the pet needs you the most. And sometimes that information doesn't do us any good because it's not relevant to what we're doing and what our purpose is. But when we're relaying the story yeah. to the ER vet, to the pet parents, these clues start becoming really, really important. Right. If you see a client's dog choke on a chicken leg, you say the time out loud when they pass out. Mm. You say the time out loud when they when you revive them with a rescue breath. And you're like, why am I doing that? Because it'll lock in your brain when you see the vet or the client. Hey, I, I saw Kona pass out at 323. I did two one minutes of rescue breaths and I revived her at 325. No matter what, if the pet acts like everything's hunky dory, you don't have x-ray vision. Anytime a pet passes out, that pet is you're calling and you're transporting to the nearest veterinary clinic. 
right? Because all those clues add up to something. And they again, <laughs> yeah. they might not be. And, I, and we don't want to make cut first aid scary. I no. think it's a superpower. I think if I could wave a wand, everybody who's in the pet industry, everyone that has a pet should take a pet first aid class of from any, you know, any competent person, any competent group, and far too few do it. But it's one of the best gifts you can ever give a pet. I have done CPR four times and saved two pets' lives. Hmm. I, I've been in situations breaking up dog fights where there's been mouth injuries, uh, puncture wounds. Uh, I've, I've dealt with dogs that flipped off a surfboard and broke a leg. And I'm just grateful I was taught the skills on what to do and when to be able to get that pet to be uh, taken safely to a veterinary clinic. So I, I just say, I think it's one of the best things you can do for your pets and for those who are in the pet industry. Our friends at Pet Perennials make it easy to send a heartfelt condolence gift directly to someone with a broken heart. They have this wonderful direct-to-consumer gift model that takes the effort off of us and ensures a thoughtful, personalized sympathy gift reaches your client or employee on your behalf. All gift packages include a handwritten card, colorful gift wrap, and shipping fees across the U.S. and Canada. They also offer an array of milestone gifts and greeting cards that can be sent to celebrate birthdays, get well wishes, and welcome new or rescued pets. Additionally, there are gift choices in case you need to send a sympathy gift in memory of a special human client or celebrate a pregnancy, engagement, or wedding of a pet lover. If you're interested, register for a free business gift perks account to unlock the all-inclusive discounted package prices. Since the service is used on an as-need basis, there are no monthly or annual obligations or minimum purchase. Learn more at PetPerennials.com and check out the business programs or register for a free gift perks account using the link in the show notes. And it's not all physical injuries. It's not injuries to legs and things like that. There's also things that, again, we need to be monitoring. And one of those is uh, is the, the poop, the, the number twos that come out. <laughs> Uh, you, because, you had me at poop. Oh I my know. gosh, Colin. <laughs> yeah, it, poop and pee matter. Yeah, and we yeah. do need to know how they're eating and how they're processing what they eat. And poop doesn't bluff. And you become a poopologist if you're a pet sitter and you need to know what are some of the, um, the normal poop should look like a Tootsie Roll. A big Tootsie Roll, little Tootsie Roll it should be brown, log shape, slightly moist. The poop that we go, uh oh may look like dried out milk duds. The dog is dehydrated. Something's going on. Or it could be like a stinky chocolate milkshake, uh, diarrhea. Uh, every one of us has had constipation and diarrhea. But when it becomes uh, chronic and not one and done, that's when you need to raise the alarm flags. So, and, and if the cat or dog, you know, if the litter pee is growing in size, it could be diabetes. Um, if the cat is sitting in the litter box and just walking out, it could be a blockage. So being a pet detective at the time where they're um, peeing and pooping is it could actually save a client's pet's life. And not being afraid to have that conversation again with the client. Yeah. Of, I mean, of, say poopologist. I mean, really? <laughs> How can you not? It, it makes you happy. Um, I mean, you're a parent. You've changed diapers. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, and what part and that actually very important is is you mentioned it's it's when the it's when it becomes chronic where a lot of this becomes an issue. Well, how in the world do you know if it's chronic or not? Well, right. you're taking photos, right? You're making notes. Oh, yeah. Sometimes I encourage something that I do is if I have, you know, if I'm taking care of a pet for over an extended period of time, I'll just have a little note on my phone of little notes of things that I that I see. Maybe I'm not updating the client exactly about it. But I can know, okay, this is the second day where the poop looked a little runny. Okay, now it's time Good. to maybe start because that happened yesterday, just like you said of calling out the time whenever the pet passed out versus revived. Okay, this is a, just a little environmental note that I'm taking so that I ha can reference back to. So whenever I'm talking to the vet and they go, well, how long has this been happening? I don't yeah. have to go, oh, I don't uh, know, uh, something. Yeah, vets <laughs> never like that. Uh? <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, and I do say this, you know, think about veterinarians they they're trying to gather as much information as you can give them in a funnel and it's sifting down to what could be the cause and what is the more specific treatment hmm. so we also train people in our first aid classes to just state the facts 
Right. We do know you love your pet. We do know we better save that pet if you're a veterinarian. But screaming, giving how you rescued this dog and blah, 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 the clock is ticking. And right. every minute counts in a first aid situation. So stating the facts, knowing you have permission to freak out later, could just be the right um, approach to save that pet's life. Right. And being being aware of that, right? Uh, you mentioned like the, I know cats, we keep coming back to that because they are, they're, they're, they're different for many people. And so being, being aware of when you're scooping, counting out the pee piles, you know, looking yeah. at the poop before you just mindlessly dump it into the bag. Yeah. Those all, they all sound like little and things, but that's your, where it starts. Is the cat that used to kind of look at you when you came in the door and did that little trill? <laughs> Not there. Yeah. Are they under the bed? Why are they under the bed? You know, what has changed? The cat's signs of change are much more subtle, less or more subtle than a dog's, obviously. Mm. Um, but pay attention to any little changes because cats are very habitual and they like to sleep at uh, 12 to 2 on this spot and 2 to 4 at this spot. And, and if there's changing some things that you've noticed, take note of it. And I love that we live in a tech society where even I can figure out my smartphone um, and and be able to take notes. And I do think that um, clients love short videos. They like the photos, sure, but there's something and, and they're, bl- you know, there's camp webcams and things like that where you can, you know, see what's going on. We have a lot of tools at our disposal now to give really good care for a pet. And my veterinarian friends say this. A little short video that you can download and send us could be a game changer. So get in the habit. If you see a cat you think is coughing up a hairball, it it may be choking or they may have something, you know, blocked in their airway. They can tell by the movement and the sound if that's a if that's a choke or is that a hairball. So I'm saying we really are lucky to have technology as our ally. And not to just dismiss those things that are a little yeah. bit different today and go, oh, I don't know what. Anyway, move on. Note that. Write that down somewhere. Shoot that video. I, you mentioned that we were taking care of a dog who was actually recovering from a pretty intensive surgery. That was okay. kind of, it was an emergency situation for the dog, and the pet parents were literally leaving like that same day to oh, go on. Wow! And think and of we, the stress that's in that environment. <laughs> <laughs> so we were taking tons of videos, not just because uh, we were taking videos initially because we wanted to send them to their their dog so they could see. Oh. She's standing. Look how she's walking. Look at her energy back because that's that you don't quite get the same feeling over text or a photo. Very but good. It, it, it was also really helpful whenever we had some concerns and we had to take her back into the vet because now, oh, look at all this documentation that we have. Here was how she was walking on the first day. Here was her on the second day. Here was her on the third day. And it, it helps that transit, that communication of information. I'm so, again, I'm, Colin, yeah. I'm so glad that you're doing that. And that's the one thing, you know, pet sitters are the eyes and the ears of, of care. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm so glad that you're doing that because yeah, that dog's a lucky dog. Yeah, thank you, thank you. She's 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 a very sweet dog. Um, I I we want to touch on one more tip for 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 cats because you, you brought it up earlier about getting it in a burrito and uh, <laughs> I, I, first pilling cats uh, and how giving cats medication. It's a little more uh, I think can be very frustrating for for pet owners and for pet care professionals. So what are a couple options that we have when it's now time to give medication to a cat? Well, um, I'm not a doctor and I don't play one on TV, but I found out from Dr. Elizabeth Collarn, who uh, runs two cat-only clinics, one in uh, Chico, California, and one in uh, Portland, Oregon. She's the past president of the American Association of Feline Practitioners, catvets.com. There is a new medication out there. And they have found that cats over age 10, up to 90% of cats over age 10 have some form of pain of arthritis. Mm. And there is now a new medicine that is given quickly in a vet's office, and it's once a month, and it saves having to give injections and pills, and it helps with their pain and their joint mobility. And you're going to ask me the name of the medicine, and I know it starts with an S. (laughs) But I'm just saying, talk to your veterinarian And educate your pet parents because maybe there are medicines out there and it's like it's not even a long visit. They come in to the vet tech, they get the injection, they go. So it is not a big, hairy, uh, long time at the at the vet. Um, But more and more cat practices are are educating. And and it's basically within the last year this came out and they're calling it a game changer because pain can make a cat irritated. Pain can impact their appetite. Pain can ir- 
impact their outlook and can cause uh, issues to other organs. So I'm just sharing some news, new muse about a new pain method that may be less crazy for the dog, for the cat parent, the cat sitter, and can be helpful to the cat. So that's number one. Number two, there are different types of toweling techniques that you can use. And there are videos out there. I have a bunch of videos at Pet First Aid for You, the Ape SPCA, have some catvets.com, have some cat videos. But you set them up for success by being in a bathroom that's warm, cozy, has good treats, and also has the, a towel wrapping. And depending on the pill, you maybe can crush it without ruining its efficacy and put it in at a churro, one of those liquid little treats that they lick up and don't even know. So there's no struggle yeah. um, when it comes to injections. Uh, the side of the mouth is the best. Give a little squirt of tuna juice with no oil, tuna water. As the first syringe, I'm the cat going, yeah, baby, I'll take a second hit. And that's the yuck. That's the medicine. Well, that wasn't fun. But I'm going to follow it up with the chaser, another tuna in water. Yeah. And you're you're and you never make a big deal you never apologize and you and you never baby talk you should make medicine as like as as just as normal as just scratching a cat under a chin and the more you can do that i mean my veterinarian shout out to dr deborah charles is the quickest sh uh, injection giver i've ever seen <laughs> the cat is being petted and and stimulated on the head and has already gotten two injections and doesn't even know it so sometimes touching another part of the body when you may have to do a, a, a insulin injection, mm. it just diverts enough that the cat doesn't even realize what has happened. Yeah. And fortunately, you know, needles, insulin needles are pretty little. Yeah. But just little techniques, you can do it. You guys can do it. Well, and that's a great reminder of that stuff that we can do before we even need to give the medicine. Yeah. Right? We can spend some time during our visit Touching some of those common yes, spots, yes. getting them habituated, getting them the treats, having that normalized for them so that when the time comes, it's not this big, oh, god. Yeah, you don't pull what? up the theme music. Dun, dun, dun! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no shotguns of confetti or anything like that. That's just, it's, just, no, no, no. It's, it's about it's normalizing boring, those practices. normal, whatever, whatever. <laughs> and that is the best approach. I, I have... Uh, I inherited a senior cat that had never let their nails be trimmed by a mere mortal other than being sedated. And Mikey now goes, Manny Petty time now, <laughs> because I made it gradual and rewarding yeah. and calm. And, you know, older kitties, they don't groom as well and their nails can get really thick and that can prevent them from being able to jump up on something. So check the kitty's nails because if they're really thick and all that. They need a, to be trimmed so that they can grip and, and get up and get down easily. Yeah. And, and just remember, because I know we have uh, times where you're at a cat visit and you're like, well, what do I what do I do with the rest of my time? It's kind of just <laughs> over there. And but these are things, right? These And it's, it sounds so silly. Like, you want me to just pet the cat a little bit on its neck and get it used to that? Yeah. Or get yeah. used to feeling its paws. Yeah, that the, all those help set that cat up for success. So whether you care for that cat for the next 18 years or somebody else has to take over care for that cat or go to a vet, you're making that life easier for that cat and you're making it having a better relationship with its pet owner so the pet owner doesn't feel guilty when these things have to happen. It does. They, they don't become hesitant to do right. these kind of interventions that the cat may need because they don't think the cat likes it. Well, I mean, and also a tip is we we do really well about crate training our dogs and, and getting them to be transported in a car. There's a lot more adventure cats out there and cats that don't need to think that every time they're in a carrier, they're going to the, the veterinarian. I call it the three C's of terror, the carrier, the car and the clinic. So I'm saying if you can educate your pet parents to have a top loading cat carrier, because it's easier to drop a kitty in a towel from the top than squeezing them in the front door and leaving it out, take out the doors or whatever, put a nice bedding in there, have a little sunlight coming through, toss in treats, get them acclimated. Mikey, that's how we did it with our senior cat. He, that's his little sleeping place now. And when you have to transport a cat in a carrier or a small dog in a carrier, never pick it up by the handle. That rocking motion agitates the pet who's already scared and injured. Hug the carrier, place it in the floor 
of the back seat right behind the passenger, back of the passenger front seat and before the bench of the back seat. Crash tests say that is the safest place to put a pet carrier. Mm. Again, thinking through all steps of those process and 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 putting that into practice, and you know, those are a lot of steps that you just listened to. More <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> so, so I, but I, I know many business owners who are solo go. Why do I need policies and procedures? I'm by myself. I don't need these kind yes, of things. Yes, you do. Well, well, this is a great reminder for how do I transport a cat to the vet? Hmm, I haven't had to do that in a couple years. I wrote those steps down. Here's this goes. And, and now you, you're not having to relearn each time. It's already lined out there for you. And then if you do bring somebody else on, you can give that to yeah. them. But it's, it's there solidified for your business. Yeah. And I'm telling you, no pet should be in the passenger front seat for yeah. many reasons. The airbag, they're too cute and distractive. And, you know, you're not paying attention to the road. Um, the back floor for the little guys in a carrier is the safest. And I, you know, I've had a 90 pound dog that we had with a, a harness and back seat uh, with the seat belt. Um, and then in the back, if you have an SUV, you can put them in, you know, a big carrier that's, you know, so there's different ways to transport, but you should make that a fun game. Feed a cat in a car, yeah, in a carrier, in your garage. And then just lift, hug the carrier, bring it back in the room, open the door and walk away. And the cat's like, what? What, what are you doing? Oh, that, was, oh, that wasn't so bad. I'm going to go back to grooming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <I'll go. laughs> so, you know, you yeah. got to out fox, out fool the feline and do it by making things a little more rewarding and fun. Um, I'm telling you, uh, I love my cats and my dogs. They both bring a lot to the table, but you really have to pay attention to a cat. I'm fortunate because my cat, Casey, is a, an alum of San Diego Humane Society. He's a therapy pet, and he's a first aid pet. And he lets anybody touch him. He's never been a stranger to a place or a person. But my cat, Rusty, got impacted like a lot of pets with separation anxiety and, and isolation from COVID. So a stranger comes in the house, and he dives under the, under the couch. But we don't make a big deal of it now. And it's getting shorter and shorter the time where he pops his head out. And he's like, oh, it's not stranger danger. These guys, they smell pretty good. Um, and so we have to do it on their timetable. But realize pets, cats, dogs are just like siblings. Everybody in the same family from the same womb can have different personalities. And just don't make blanket assumptions. Arden, I really want to thank you for coming on the show today and giving us some great tips for looking, listening, and paying attention to the little behaviors so that we can catch on to those and for walking us through some first aid basics and paying attention. I know that you uh, are the wordsmith and pun maestro, and so you have a lot going on. And you have But we want to give these books away, right? Yes, we do have some books that we want to give away. So um, we, we're going to be entering into a giveaway for some of your, your new books. Remind us what the titles of those were. All right, we're going to give away a signed copy of my newest book. It's called The Dog Behavior Answer Book, Understanding and Communicating with Your Dog to Build a Strong, Happy Relationship. And we're going to give a book away called The Cat Behavior Answer Book, and that is understanding how cats think, why they do what they do, and how to strengthen our relationship with them. So we really do appreciate being on uh, Pet Sitter Confessional, uh, Colin, and we would love to... Uh, have two lucky winners. Arden, how can people follow along with the rest of your work, catch your radio shows and your podcast? Thank you. Uh, my Facebook is Arden Moore. That's easy. Uh, Ardenmore.com website, pet first aid, the number four, the letter U, pet first aid for you.com. And my two shows are O Behave on Pet Life Radio and Arden Moore's Four Legged Life, nationally syndicated radio show on fourleggedlife.com. And finally, Check me out on YouTube. we got a great channel with over 500 videos of all kinds of helping. And you just need to go to Arden Moore's channel on YouTube. Yeah, you, you've given me quite a lot of lists or links to <laughs> add. Because my last to name is Moore. <laughs> <laughs> so all of those uh, will be in the show notes uh, for this episode and on our website. So people can click to those and start getting the resources that they need. Uh, and Arden, as, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I've really enjoyed today. I, thank you. I love you, what you do, Colin, and you and Megan. And thank you for being uh, uh, a pet's best uh, 
health ally as a professional pet sitter too. So thank you. I really appreciate this opportunity. If you're interested in winning one of her books, here's what you need to do. Send an email to feedback at petsitterconfessional.com with your best dog walking or pet sitting tip that you want to share with other dog walkers and pet care professionals. We will both share these tips out on the next podcast, but we will also, from the people who enter and send this information in, we will randomly select a winner. One person will win the Dog Behavior Answer Book, Understanding and Communicating Your Dog and Building a Strong and Happy Relationship. Another person will enter the Cat Behavior Answer Book, Understanding How Cats Think, Why They Do What They Do, and How to Strengthen Our Relationships with Them. To be entered to win these books, you must send an email to feedback at Petster Confessional by February 15th, 2023. Again, feedback at PetsterConfessional.com by February 15th with your best dog walking and pet care tip. We want to thank our sponsors today, Timed Pet and Pet Perennials, for making this show possible. And we're so, so thankful for you listening today. We can't tell you how much we appreciate it. It means so much for every week you tuning in and sharing our episodes. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your week, and we'll be back again soon.